Good evening and welcome back to Catechesis with the Pastor. Uh, tonight we're just doing a big show and tell of all of the different uh, things that we use in the liturgy, various vestments and various uh, accoutrements that we have here tonight. Um, if you are uh, joining us online, uh, there is down in that right corner, there is that rumble talk um, that you can use to uh, send in questions um, and comments. Uh, there is a little bit of a delay. Uh, so if you can make sure that slider is also all the way over to the right so that you are in sync with us as much as possible, that would be very good as well. Uh, the... Um, uh, I, I developed this presentation and a whole bunch of uh, questions in a quiz. Uh, maybe we'll put the quiz, the quizzes up online afterwards. Um, but I also did this at, uh, uh, at Holy Family Cathedral up in uh, Anchorage, back when it used to be a cathedral. Uh, so we had a lot of other things that belong to bishops that I don't have access to right now. But um, aside from that, we, we've got quite a few things to show and quite a few things to look at. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. From the book of Exodus. Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and has filled him with a divine spirit of skill and understanding and knowledge in every craft, in the production of embroidery, in making things of gold, silver, or bronze, in cutting and mounting precious stones, in carving wood, and in every other craft. He has also given both him and Ochilab, son of Amash Ashimach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has endowed them with skill to execute all types of work, engraving, embroidering, the making of variegated cloth, of violet, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen thread, weaving, and all other arts and crafts. Heavenly Father, you have allowed us to apply the greatest works of our hands, that they might be used in the sacred liturgy, and that the worship of you might be made more beautiful by them. Send us your Holy Spirit, that we might come to know and understand a little more about the items we use in the liturgy, that through that understanding, we may be drawn ever deeper into prayer and into union with you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right. So I think tonight we're going to start with vestments. Um, we got a whole bunch of vestments over here to look at. Um, uh, first, let's, let's just talk about color, right? So there are various colors that we use. Uh, in, in the liturgy and in the liturgical year. Um, so we have the color white, right? What do we, what do we use the color white for? Easter, Christmas, right? Um, for any of the saints uh, that, are, that are not martyrs, right? We, we wear white for those saints who are not martyrs, not apostles. Um, I, so, um, white is also, uh, it's, it's explicitly, it's, it's the color you can use anytime. So if, um, if you're a priest and you're traveling or do, you just want to bring a white set of vestments, that's cool, right? So you don't need to bring every single color that you might need. Um, you can always, always just use white. Green, right? We have our green vestments, and we use green during ordinary time. Uh, and, and then uh, sometimes on the Feast of St. Alphonsus, when that's what the sacristan put out, and you didn't notice. Um, 
actually have happened today. Um, uh, yeah, so green, green is just uh, that color for ordinary time, uh, for Sundays and for weekdays in that ordinary time when there isn't some other memorial, some other celebration that we're doing. Purple or violet? For Lent, right? And? And Advent? And? It's, it's often used for funerals. Um, the, the purple is a, it's a penitential color, right? Um, and so it goes, especially with Lent and Advent, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Norvis Ordo, it's also become an option for funerals, um, that, that purple or violet. Yeah. Does the uh, penitential aspect of purple have any sort of connection with the royal aspect that was had many times? Um, I don't. I don't know uh, what exactly that would be. Um, uh, what gives it that that royal aspect is the cost of purple dyes, right? So it's it's um, uh, yeah. So then we have red. Right, which we use for martyrs and for any any Pentecost, any celebrations associated with the Holy Spirit, right? What else? So confirmation, right? Again, yeah, those celebrations for the associated with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then of course the, the King of Martyrs would be Jesus, right? Okay. <laughs> King of Martyrs would be Jesus. We do we do wear wear red on on Good Friday, right? Okay. Okay. Um, black. We have this beautiful black vestment. Um, uh, black has traditionally been the the color that was used for funerals, um, and a couple of other. Uh, days as well. It was, um, I, but uh, especially for funerals, right? And um, that that color of mourning, right? That we have. And then um, we often have uh, vestments that have varying amounts of gold, right? Um, those those all fall under the category of white vestments. Right, they're, 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 wherever it says white, that applies to anything that's gold. Um, uh, we didn't bring down a, uh, some of our Marian vestments, uh, which often have blue accents on them, but they're, they're still part of that category of sort of white or gold vestments that we would use. All right, any questions on, on the colors? Oh, we did, didn't we? All right, a a a rose colored vestment. What what do we use the the rose? Third Sunday of Advent and the fourth Sunday of Lent, right? So Gaudete and Laetare uh, Sundays, um, uh, and both of those are the Sundays that mark we're we're past the halfway point. Right, the halfway point of Advent, the halfway point of Lent, um, and so it's it's sort of a celebratory garment um, that traditionally comes from uh, like a faded purple garment. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, you will hear you will hear the uh, the sort of debates um, about what color it it is. Um, uh, English is is one of the few languages that actually has a a proper name for the, the color of light red. Most, most, most languages don't have a proper name for that. And so when, when a language doesn't have a proper name for a color, they just use uh, something that, that's familiar to them that has that color, or they, um, or they, they uh, augment one of the other colors, right? So, so we, we have a word for light red, right? And it's pink. Um, we don't have a word for light blue. Right in Russian, they actually have a word for light blue, that says different from the word for blue as pink is from red. Right, it's a very distinct word. Um, but so so in 
uh, most languages, uh, like red is, is, is called rose. Um, there, there is a, uh, sort of official, uh, color of, of Roman rose, uh, that, that is a darker, um, on the, on the more red and the darker side. And so you'll get debates about that, but, um, yeah, it, it's essentially pink. That's okay. <laughs> Father Thomas Aquinas does have a vestment that is, uh, yes, is quite pink. Mr. Pat. There has been an attempt um, I, to sort of make a distinction between the purple of Advent and the purple of Lent, even to the point of making the purple of Advent blue and, and having blue vestments. Um, there, there, is, uh, um, there is nothing official about that. That's, that's just sort of a, uh, yeah. It, it's, it's something that some people have tried to do. There, there's nothing, no official distinction like that in the church. Um, uh, in, uh, and some of this can get very confused with also different Protestant circles. Um, Anglicans will often very intentionally use blue during Advent. Uh, and, and blue is not a liturgical color for us. So, so that comes uh, into play as well. Um, but because of that, you will have uh, companies selling blue vestments and advertising them for Advent, and you will have people buying them, um, even though uh, we don't use blue vestments for Advent. So, yeah. Any other questions on just the colors? Yeah. So, so we often have um, different different accents that get used with with the different colors. Yeah. Uh, when we're all Saints Day would have been white, but All Souls Day would have been black. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, a floor-length tunic worn by clergy as choir dress and as everyday wear, uh, and by servers in the liturgy. For priests and servers, it's generally black. Any guesses? A cassock, right? Yeah, a cassock. Um, so buttons uh, going down the center. Uh, a black. This is this is a very small one for an altar boy, um, but uh, yeah. So a, a cassock is that that black tunic um, that that priests and servers um, would be would be wearing. Um, is it also associated with missionaries? It. Um, I, I, so it's it's associated with the priesthood. And so those missionary priests would be wearing cassocks because that's associated with the priesthood. Um, and it, uh, a, a number of religious orders um, uh, have adopted the cassock as their habit. Um, they might have, there might be cer certain features to it that are distinct. Um, uh, the Jesuit cassock uh, doesn't button all the way down. So, so there's, there's uh, something, some that doesn't button all the way down. Um, organists like to get their hands on a Jesuit cassock because it gives more freedom uh, to their, their playing. Um, but uh, yeah, so you, you might have some slightly different designs and whatnot that were used. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's principally, it's that, that associated with their, their priestly character. Uh, a short alb, uh, normally worn over a cassock or habit for liturgical functions outside of mass or minor roles in the mass, generally white. Surplus, surplus, yeah. Okay. So a surplus, a surplus really is, it's a short alb, 
right? Um, what, do, uh, what does the word, word alb mean? White. It just means white, the white thing that you wear. Um, so, but, but a surplus is a short one, uh, and this is, this is often used, um, especially outside of the Mass. If I'm doing a baptism, I'll put a surplus on. Um, if I'm doing a house blessing, I'll bring a surplus with me and put a, put a surplus on. Um, uh, and, then, and then often servers will wear a surplus. Um, I, sometimes uh, priests, one of the things that, uh, one of the terms to know, I think I've used it already, is, is choir dress. And that's, that's if you are showing up to, um, I, to either sit in choir during the Mass or to, to sing um, the liturgy of the hours or something like that, what is the proper dress for you to wear um, to be in the sanctuary or whatnot? So w what is the proper dress depends on all kinds of different things, right? Um, but, but often that proper dress is, the, um, for a priest, is that cassock and surplus, okay? For a Dominican, it is our Dominican habit. That is our choir dress. Um, I, so yeah, there, there are um, different things. So but surplus, um, and this is, uh, th this, this square neck is called a Roman cut for, for that surplus. Um, uh, this is very uh, handy to have, especially when you have a big hood that, that is part of, and you, you need the surplus to go on over the hood. Um, that, uh, that can be. Dominicans also have a, uh, a sort of tradition the surplus is worn under the hood if you are not ordained. If you're ordained, it's worn over the hood. So you, you'll see the brothers um, taking off their hood and putting on the surplus and then putting the hood back on and serving. So. All right. Um, oh, I... Uh, I don't have one of these around. Uh, a sash worn around a cassock, especially for choir dress. Anybody know what that's called? Sometimes see it's a broad band of cloth that goes around and then usually flips down, right? It's a fascia. Um, I, so Dominicans don't, don't wear those or have those around very much. So um, didn't have one of those. Uh, a cloth with long strips that tie around the body used to cover the collar or the hood uh, before wearing an alb. It's the first thing the priest will put on as he's vesting. It's called an amos. Called an amos. So... Um, as a Dominican, I, I have a very large amos um, because the amos has to go over my hood. The whole point of the amos is to keep my filthiness off of the nice, pretty vestments, right? So, so the amos is to make sure that the whole of my filthy, smelly habit gets covered, right, before I go putting on vestments. So, how do we spell it? A M I C E, Amos. Right. Uh, so then, after I put on the Amos, right, uh, the the floor length, uh, the white floor length garment used in the Mass and other important liturgies, uh, the proper garment of the baptized, which is the alb, right, the white thing. This is the alb I usually use for my daily mass. Um, you'll notice it doesn't, it doesn't have that Roman neck. Um, I, I do have my Sunday mass alb has one, but this one does have a tie, and that makes it, that makes it easier um, to go around the neck as well. All right, so the white alb. Really should have picked a cooler night to be <laughs> doing this. 
Um, yeah, there was some recent controversy that came up about albs being made out of lace. Um, uh, the primary reason to make albs out of lace is they become so much lighter. And there's so much more air that can flow out through them. If you're in a hot climate, an alb made of lace is very nice. Um, it's not about being extra fancy. It's just about being cool. Um, okay, a generic term for a rope or belt or sash used to gather the garment about the waist is a cincture, right? A cincture, the cincture cinches the garment, right? Um, so we have a cincture. Can put around. Okay. Um, a a small. Uh, yeah. So the the cincture is just it's really just to cinch everything in, just sort of hold everything together. Um, a small colored strip of cloth that looks like a mini stole draped over the left arm at mass. This is for the old right. Um, we don't see this. Uh, so much anymore. It's a manifold. Man okay. Um, the the manifold, the tradition of the manifold was that uh, it was it was a cloth, uh, so that the the um, uh, and it, initially it was a cloth, and I believe it was a corporal um, draped over the arm so that the priest could dry his tears as he was weeping during the Mass. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a manipole um, that hangs over that, that left arm. Um, and again, this is, this is something that you don't see in the, um, in the Norvis Ordo. Um, it's, it's not described. Um, uh, there, there becomes debate about whether or not you can or can't wear it, um, but it's, it's certainly not described in the liturgy anymore. Um, uh, the the um, colored, uh, um, oh right, the, the long strip of cloth that hangs about the neck, and it denotes one's level of authority. Stole. Right, the right. stole, okay? Um, uh, so this is a, obviously, right? So the, um, uh, the positioning of the stole has been used to, to tell you what somebody's authority is. A deacon wears a stole like this, across the chest and crossed down at the hip. Traditionally, a priest during the mass would wear a stole that was crossed. Um, so that, that, that crossing of the stool would actually, it would be the same crossing as, as the deacons, right? But instead of the hip, it's now moved to the front. And then the bishop would wear his stool straight up and down. Um, in, the, in the Norvis Ordo, in the modern rite, the, the priests generally wear the stool straight up and down um, regardless. Um, and you will still see some priests who choose to cross the stole to remind themselves they're not a bishop. <laughs> Maybe there are more priests that should do that. But. Okay. And then, um, uh, so uh, then for a deacon, the deacon has a special garment that he puts on over all of this. Do we know what that's called? The deacon's garment is called a dalmatic. And what, what, you, what makes a dalmatic different from um, these, uh, these chasubles that we're, we're going to look at, the dalmatic has sleeves. Right? So, so there, there are actual sleeves on the dalmatic. The, um, the dalmatic uh, is actually based off of the emperor's um, clothing and what was common for the emperor to wear. 
in the Eastern churches, the, the dalmatic is more like the, what, what the bishop wears as opposed to what the deacon wears. Somehow in the Western tradition, that kind of got flipped um, and, and kind of confused. Um, but that dalmatic, the colorful garment that, that's, that has those sleeves for the deacon to wear. Um, and then the, the colored covering garment for the priest at the mass is that chasuble, right? The chasuble is, um, it's meant to be, uh, it's a sign of charity. So the stole is a sign of my authority, right? And I cover the stole with a chasuble, right, as a sign of charity, right? So I'm, I'm not um, showing off my authority <laughs> to all of you in the context of the mass. Um, be because those are the, the significations of those garments, um, the, the popular thing to do after the Second Vatican Council is to put the stole on the outside of the chasuble really, really sends confusing um, signals, right? <laughs> Putting the authority over charity doesn't uh, really work very well. There are different uh, cuts of chasubles. There, there are all different kinds of cuts. Um, probably the three most common that we have represented here. Um, first, okay, long, uh, going all the way down to the floor and going all the way out across my arm. This is a Gothic cut, okay? It's a Gothic chasuble. We also have um, what, what's called a semi-Gothic cut. And that's, that's just going to go down to about my elbow. Um, I, I like the semi-Gothic cut. It's like the best of both worlds. Um, <laughs> you, you have more mobility and freedom with your arm, but you still get that grandeur of, of the Gothic cut that is so lovely. And then we have a, a, a style that's called a fiddleback. Uh, now, fiddle, fiddleback chasuble just drapes over, and it needs to be tied, um, just because. So it's, it's also got ties. Okay. Um, fiddlebacks. Fiddlebacks were often, um, like this one is very stiff. Um, and uh, that sort of presumes a liturgy where you're not going to be sitting very much. And when you did sit, you had to have a server come and lift this up and put this over the chair for you so that you didn't sit on it because it was so stiff. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's another reason why um, fiddlebacks have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, uh, we shouldn't, though, be confused, right? The Gothic cut is a much older cut than, than the fiddleback. So it's, it's not, uh, and styles in dress, liturgical dress, have changed and varied throughout the history of the church, and they will continue to change and vary. And yeah, they're not, the cuts of the chasuble are not tied to the right. So there, there's no, like, changing to the Norvis Ordo doesn't change the style of, um, chasuble or anything like that. Those will change as preferences changes um, through the church. So, any questions on, on the basic vestments? Will I take them off? <laughs> Just a practical question. So, if you're down in the Amazon as a priest, do yes. you still have to deck out and deck everything? Um, uh, you, 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 you might not uh, wear everything, or, or you might find really light versions of everything. Um, uh, yeah, that can be the, the variance. Um, it also, right, it really depends on what materials they're all made of. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the tradition, um, as, as we heard in the scripture reading, of using linen and... Um, linen, of course, is very breathable. Um, now, of course, almost everything is cotton polyester or something like that, and it's it's not so great at doing that. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so so that would that would depend. Um, uh, one of the nice things actually about chasubles, um, especially if they if they drape, uh, as you move your arms, you you wind up like sucking all this air up into you. It it can actually be very cooling. Um, and much better than a Dalmatic, where everything's all like closed in, and there's no way to get that air into there. So, um, yeah. Um, there are lots of uh, vendors around the world who make vestments. Um, uh, these uh, fiddleback sets that uh, Father Thomas Aquinas uh, purchased um, are actually from a company in India that makes them. Um, uh, but yeah, so there are there are all kinds of um, vestments. The the um, uh, and of course a lot of the, the the highest quality and the the best are known for their shops in Rome. That's that you can uh, go to. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, when, when we decide there's a need and we have the money to do it. Um, uh, there are places you can get very cheap vestments and they are very cheap vestments. <laughs> and, um, and then there, there are some very, very fine vestments that are very expensive, um, uh, but will last and you can have vestments that, that last for years. When, when I come out for communion, yeah, so I, I generally, I put on a surplus, right? So the short version of the alb, uh, and I put a stole on over it. Um, and, and again, that's, that, um, that's showing that I'm engaging, I'm knowingly engaging in a priestly function, right, by wearing the stole, uh, that sign of authority. Uh, one uh, sort of aside, one of the things that a, a bishop wears in particular, particular um, wears, wears a special cross on his chest that is supposed to not have a corpus. It's just a cross. It's not a crucifix. And do we know what kind of a cross that is, what the name for that is? It's a pectoral cross, right? Pectoral, just chest. Right, because it's on his chest. So, um, but it's it it's supposed to. I've seen bishops who don't do this, but it's supposed to not have a corpus on it, right? Because who is the one on the cross? It's the bishop himself, right? He is to be on the cross, right? He is to be the corpus on the cross. Um, is where that that tradition comes from. Um, an archbishop. Uh, sorry, did you have a question? <laughs> um, an archbishop has a wool collar that he'll wear on top of his chasuble when he's celebrating mass, um, as long as he is within his own province. Um, do we know what that's called? They are given out once a year by the pope. It's called a pallium. Pallium. Um, and they're they're made of wool, and it's it's a sign of his his role as a shepherd. Um, and and to get your pallium, you have to go to Rome 
and receive it from the hands of the Pope. So when somebody is made an archbishop, um, he doesn't have a pallium until, um, and I think it's the feast of uh, the solemnity of St. Peter and Paul, he goes to Rome and receives that pallium from the Pope, and then he can wear his, his pallium when he celebrates Mass in his province. Um, okay. Uh, a large colored cape worn for major liturgical events outside of the Mass. It's the cope. Okay, so the, the cope um, is this, this is a stole for it, is this open cape. Um, and so you'll see us especially using it for adoration. Um, uh, I'll wear it for baptisms. Uh, if I was doing a wedding where there wasn't a mass, right, a cope would be an appropriate thing to be wearing for that. Um, uh, processions generally a cope would be the thing that you wear. So it's, it, it's sort of the highest level of dress we have for something that's outside of the mass. Okay. Um, a colored veil that, that the, um, used especially by a priest giving benediction, usually matching with the cope. Okay, it's called, this is called a humeral veil. So the humoral veil, uh, where is your humerus? Right, so it drapes over your arms. Okay, and the, the purpose of these kinds of veils, we'll look at another one um, in a little bit, uh, is, is to indicate that uh, what the person is doing or what they're holding is that, that it's, it's not really coming from them. That it's, it's not really, it's beyond their authority. Okay? So when the priest gives benediction, right? Benediction is, is, is with the blessed sacrament, right? It is not the priest on his priestly authority blessing you. It is Christ himself blessing you. Right? And that's signified by the priest covering his hand so that it's clear this is not a blessing coming from him. It's a blessing coming from the monstrance, coming from Christ himself. Yeah. So it certainly is, is the case that um, uh, the priest's hands are covered in chrism, sacred chrism, and consecrated. Um, for that, um, uh, the um, uh, the emphasis, though, is is making it clear that this is something very different than the normal blessing that a priest gives, which he gives on the authority that's been given to him. Rather, this is the very blessing of Christ. There are special blessings, um, uh, uh, papal blessings, that that a priest can bestow. With, with the permission, right, with the order, right, from, from the Pope, from the Vatican, right? And he uses, he uses a special cross. And again, it should be covered, right? This is not his blessing. This is a blessing that he is um, doing uh, on behalf of someone else's, as it were. Somebody else's authority. Yeah. Um, um, uh, a parish should have their own set of vestments. Often priests will often will also have sets of vestments, um, I, especially since you can't always guarantee what the vestments at a parish are going to look like. So, yeah, or how they'll fit. Um, uh, so, um, uh, both Father Thomas Aquinas and Father Francis. Um, have have their own sets of vestments, 
Why? Because most vestments are too long for them, right? So it's, it's, um, I am just at the height where most vestments are okay. Um, uh, so you can get much shorter than that and you're probably going to wind up getting your own vestments or you get your own vestments because you're so tall and, you know, having chasubles that barely go down past your waist is just not becoming. So, Um, but there's there's another veil, uh, just like that, that's uh, usually plain um, and used by servers who hold the bishop's mitre and crozier. It's also the name of the servers themselves. That's right. <laughs> I was blanking on the word. called a vimpa. And the, the servers are called vimps. <laughs> and so, um, so again, right, it's the, the server is holding the miter or is holding the crozier Right, but but obviously he doesn't have the authority to bear a crozier or something like that, right? So having the veil is is part of that signifying, right? He has the crozier, but he's not the bishop; it's not really his um, authority. Um, uh, with a crozier, right, and and um, the the hook of the crozier should also be turned backwards um, as a sign that that it's not his authority. Um, and something, something I thought we had here, but I must be thinking back to Anchorage. Um, uh, usually a plain apron used especially when a bishop is using chrism while seated um, or for the washing of the feet on Holy Thursday. It's called a gremial. And it, it's... Um, uh, it's very similar to like a really large amos. It just ties around the waist, um, and it it's there to catch the the chrism um, when a when a bishop is, um, especially when he's doing an ordination and pouring that chrism on the priest's hands, uh, uh, or for for the washing of the feet, the gremial veil. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. Any questions on vestments? Uh, I wanted to circle back to your time on the bishop and the minor talk about the culture. Uh, the Pope has traditionally worn a consecration. Um, um, I'm not familiar with that. So. Yeah, I'd have to, have to look that up. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so uh, hopefully in the context of a, um, a, a well-ordered parish, you, you've got a group of sacristans um, slash an altar society that's taking care of everything that's going on in the sacristy and all of the different things. Um, uh, most vestments need to be dry cleaned. Um, uh, so that's, that's often the case. Um, yeah. So yeah, just having people around to make sure that happens. Um, and of course, if everybody's wearing their amice, that helps, you know, in terms of... Um, um, we, we don't. We do have a, a um, full set of black vestments that are on loan to Portland right now. So unfortunately, I don't have a Deacon's Dalmatic to show. But yeah.
All right. Let's, uh, um, okay. So what do we call the, uh, the consecrated gold or silver cup used to hold the precious blood? The chalice, right? Okay. Right, so we have our chalice. Um, the consecrated gold plate on which the sacred host is laid. Right, the paten, right? Also, um, uh, the name for a communion plate that has a handle. Um, I, so... Right, so both of these are patents, right? Um, this is a patent that's going to go and be used with the chalice. Um, this is a patent that a server would use. Part of the idea is that the, um, the, the patent is a sacred vessel. And so it's something that, that shouldn't normally be touched except by the priest. So the servers can have one with a handle, uh, so they're not touching the patent. Um, A chaliced shaped vessel with a lid uh, to hold consecrated hosts for the distribution of the faithful or to be reserved in the tabernacle is a saborium. Okay, so we have our saborium. Uh, and, you know, just to note, like the, the chalice shape, right, this, this shape, it's ridiculously practical, right? So you, you can see, like, how... Easy, it just balances in my hand, right? It just, it's just two fingers there. It just, it's so easy to hold and maintain um, and, and not spill, right? It's just very practical. Um, the, I think there was a movement against this uh, after the Second Vatican Council. I, I, the only thing I can come up with was they thought it was too fancy. They wanted something simpler, right? But it... It, it's not about being fancy. It's about being ridiculously practical, right? Um, the, same, the same with a chalice, right? And this, this node allows so much um, uh, stability, right? Do I hold it in a good chalice? has a really good weight at the bottom, right? So that it doesn't matter how much liquid is in the cup. It's still always bottom heavy and always is, is just going to sit and be stable, right? So there's very little chance of it actually tipping Okay, the vessels that hold the water and wine before consecration? Cruets. All right, so we got cruets, water, wine. Um, the vessel that holds or catches water when the priest's fingers are washed? <laughs> the basin, it's called a lavabo bowl, which the wash bowl, I mean, that's really what it, right? So we have these fancy Latin-based names, but they just mean really, really simple things. Um, uh, okay, a gold or silver, silver vessel, often in a sunburst shape uh, with a clear glass area for viewing the Blessed Sacrament. Used during benediction and processions for adoration by the faithful, etc. A monstrance. Right, and it's called it's called monstrance from the same Latin root from which we get demonstrate. Right? To show. It, it, it's the thing that 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 allows us to show the blessed sacrament. Uh, the incense burner used at Mass uh, that hangs from chains so it can be swung to incense people and things. Thurible. A thurible. A thurible, right, which is carried by a thurifer. 
right? Um, uh, so this is this is what's called a three chain thurible, even though it's got four chains, right? But it's it's three chains that hold it up, and then one that's there just to just to control the lid, right? So that lifting of the lid. Um, and what's what's really um, uh, the the three chain thuribles were were um, made so that that having handling the thurible could actually be done just by one person. Um, and so in the in the Dominican Rite, there, there's a presumption that there is no. Uh, let's see, that should be the next one. A small container, um, also called a custodia, used to carry the sacred. Oh no no no, that's not what I want. Where is that? Do to do. Anyways, um, the little thing that carries incense. It's called a boat. I don't know why it's called a boat, but it's called a boat. Um, so uh, uh, part of the idea with the, the three chain is it actually makes it possible for one person to handle the whole of the incense. So in the Dominican Rite, um, somebody can hold the boat and hold the, the, the incense, um, can pull this around to open it and keep it open, can spoon out the incense, right, and, and have that, all of that coordination to take care of that all by himself. It's actually, it's a monastic uh, custom, um, just monks would would train and would learn how to use a thurible that way. Yeah. When are the appropriate times to use the incense? That's a great question. Um, I so. Um, so for one, it, it is very appropriate to use incense whenever there is a procession of the Blessed Sacrament, um, whenever there is, um, I, and, and it's, it's very appropriate for adoration. It's very appropriate in the Mass, especially the higher the celebration and the signification of the Mass, that, that incense be used. Um, there used to be very strict rules about when incense was used and when it was not, and now there are not strict rules about when incense is used. And when it is not, um, yeah. All right, any questions so far? Okay. A small container, also called a custodia, used to carry the sacred host when taking to the sick or the homebound. A pix. Right. So this is a pix. A uh, the the container for holding the holy water. Aspersory, right? <laughs> so we, we often call it the water bucket or something like that. So, um, but the aspersory, right? And and in it goes the aspergillium, aspergillium, asparagus mint, right? Wash me, cleanse me from my sins. All right. Um, and just like, so the, the way this is constructed, right, is there, there are holes in the top here. So as, as it's put in the holy water, water collects in here. Um, and then you, you, you pick it up and the water is sitting there. And then you, and water goes flying out of the holes, right? And sprays all, all over.
Um, I don't have one of these here because we don't have an extra one, right? But the circular uh, shaped gold or silver uh, gilded clip with clear glass that holds the host in place in the monstrance. What is that called? The thing I put in the monstrance. It's called a Luna. It's called a Luna. Um, because the original ones uh, weren't a full circle. They, they were just like a crescent moon shape. It would hold the host, and, and that was the Luna. Right. Okay. A small silk cloth of the same color as the priest's vestments, unless the sacristan sets out different colors for no apparent reason, um, <laughs> Used to cover the chalice. What's that? Yeah, the chalice fail, right? Okay, so a chalice veil. And we'll put the whole chalice together in a moment here. A, a rectangular piece of linen or hemp used for cleansing the chalice as well as the priest's lips and the fingers after communion. It's a purificator. Okay. So the um, uh, the purificator, right? So it's it's rectangular. It's folded in threes like this, and then in in half. There's usually there's a red cross in the center of it. Um, sometimes, sometimes you'll find them folded like this, um, so that they they sit very easily on top of the chalice. Um, the purificator is not blessed, and the original use of the purificator uh, was was not to not to handle the blessed sacrament, um, but to wipe something after it has had the blessed sacrament, touching it. So, so the the idea was that um, you you've already you've already rinsed the chalice out through the oblations, through the oblutions, and then you are drying it with the purificator. You've already washed the priest's fingers, and then he is drying it with the purificator, right? Um, and it comes from this notion that we find in the Old Testament, right, of not only needing to purify yourself before you enter the temple but then needing to purify yourself before you leave. Because cause you, you gotta, like, you, you, have to, you have to wash away that divine residue, right? Like, like you, you, can't just, you can't just go back into the world. Like, there needs to be some sort of preparation to leave that space. There needs to be some sort of preparation for the chalice before we just put it back in a cupboard, right? Um, that, that there needs to be this purification that's taking place um, after touching the whole ring. Not just before, but after. Um, so that's, that's the traditional use of the purificator. In the, in the modern rite, you see it used a lot for um, wiping the chalice when, when it's being um, distributed for Holy Communion. Um, I, and, but, but that was not its original sort of intent, um, which is interesting. Um, what, what did have sort of that original intent uh, was a blessed, stiff, square piece of linen, sometimes decorated with a cross or other embroidery, uh, used, oh, um, well, this too, uh, used to cover the chalice to prevent impurities from falling into it. It built. Oh, there it is. This is a pall. The Paul. Um, so you have the chalice, you have the purificator, you have the patent on top of the chalice, and then the Paul to go on top of that. Right? The Paul is blessed. It is expected that the Paul will come in contact with the Blessed Sacrament. Right? And the Paul is actually blessed um, with uh, with the same. Uh, same blessing as the blessed square linen cloth which is spread out by the priest in the middle of the altar. 
the corporal, right? Um, so it's, it's there to catch the body, right? The corpus, it is the corporal. Um, and this is a clean corporal. It hasn't been used. Um, gener generally, like the presumption when handling a corporal is that it may have been used and there may be like particles on the corporal. So you should be very careful handling um, a corporal. Um, but intentionally, no, this one has not been used. So just so you can see, right? Um, and even there's a very specific way that it's supposed to be folded just to make sure that if there are any particles there, then everything's going to be um, kept within there, right? So this is what the priest lays out, um, and this is what this is this is the space in which the sacrifice of the mass is going to be taking place on the altar. Is what the corporal has designated, um, and again, it's blessed, and the expectation is that it it is going to come in contact with the blessed sacrament. In the Dominican rite, um, the consecration does not take place on the paten. The, the, the host is put directly onto the corporal, right? Um, in fact, the, the, um, uh, yeah, the only reason the patent needs to be purified in the Dominican Rite is because you've used it to, like, clean things up after communion, right? Or, or you happen to use it during communion, but it's not actually part of the consecration. Um, it's, it's the corporal that, that the host is placed directly on. For that so um, the corporal is is often uh, it, it should be uh, well starched and stiff part of this is because you don't want it to absorb anything that spills on it you want you want that to um, just stay on top of it whereas the purificator you you do want that to absorb whatever you're wiping right um, Yeah, yeah, well, um, uh, so in terms of the use of the patent, I don't know what what was uh, common or not. Um, uh, the patent certainly has a role to play in the whole of the Dominican liturgy. It's just not what the host is consecrated over. Yeah, I don't I don't know the the history of that. Um, a uh, square container to hold the corporal. Uh, uh, this covers the chalice uh, before the mass with the opening facing towards the priest. It's a burse, right? That's also the name of the leather pouch that holds the picks, right? This is a burse. It sounds like purse, and that's what it is. Right, it, it, it's that's the same same thing, right? So it's it's um, the the leather pouch that that holds the picks. It is um, the pouch that holds the corporal in the burse. As we finish putting together the chalice, right? The chalice veil goes over the pall. And the burst sits on top with that opening to the back. And that opening is covered up by the back end of the chalice veil. So. All right, anything else I missed there? Oh, uh, uh, these may be made of any material, preferably linen, right, and are used at the lavabo and um, after communion. <laughs> lavabo towel or finger towel, the technical term is manaturgium, which means hand towel. Literally, the hand towel. Fancy word for hand towel. So, um, yeah, so manaturgium. Uh, really, just any other towel that we're using for whatever reason um, can really just, just be called that. 
And I think that's all of those different things. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the um, a number of these objects, uh, it's, it is considered very important that uh, whatever whatever the chalice or the ciborium, whatever they're they're made of, are are to be precious metals. Um, so we don't want things that are going to corrode easily. Uh, we don't want things that um, uh, that aren't aren't recognized as special or sacred. As the church has come into contact with um, uh, outside of the Western uh, tradition, um, the the discussion about what else might be suitable for for making uh, sacred vessels is is definitely a conversation that comes up. Um, I, one of the one of the things like uh, glass is really not suitable, right? Why? Because it's so breakable. Right, so so glass is generally not um, an option. Wood is generally not an option because it, it just because it's so porous, right? And it, and it absorbs things and and then um, uh, and deteriorates faster than than other things. So that's that's generally not a good option. Um, uh, there certainly is some some tradition of the use of polished stone. Uh, this was very common in the Middle East. Uh, and um, uh, the the uh, a, a very good candidate for the actual Holy Grail. Um, uh, there actually is a, a great history um, that that we do have the Holy Grail. We do have what um, our Lord used at the Last Supper uh, that was brought to Rome by Saint Peter um, and is now in uh, I believe it's Valencia in Spain. Um, at the cathedral there, but it is it is a stone cup. It is a stone cup that is now covered by a, a 14th century um, metal and jeweled thing to to house it. But but it is it is a stone cup, and it it is very clearly a first century BC um, sacred drinking vessel from the Middle East. So it it certainly fits that. But um, so so there would be some argument for for polished stone. Um, but uh, uh, generally that, that preference is that, that gold and that silver. Um, there is a lot of work, especially in poorer um, areas around the world, um, uh, for, uh, for donations of these kinds of things to be given. Um, even for, uh, for bishops from some of these poorer areas, right, that, that other bishops donate things so that they can wear the proper regalia, they can have the proper things um, to wear. So. When I was young, mom, mom used to say that um, uh, it was the uh, family because it was Yeah, so uh, there, there definitely was a tradition of. Um, uh, and this was this is sort of tied to the whole like dowry kind of sense that the family would provide a priest his chalice, right? Um, I and uh, um, so that's that and that still continues um, today, um, though generally outside of religious orders. So when you're in a religious order, you have that vow of poverty. Anything that's given to you. It may be for your use, but technically it belongs to the order, right? Um, and the order has chalices. We don't, we don't need a, a ton of new chalices, right? Every single time somebody gets ordained. So, um, uh, so that that's not um, not as common among religious, but certainly among diocesan clergy, it still is often the case that their family will will make that purchase of their chalice. Yeah. Is, is what still used? Uh, is, gold is, gold? is gold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We still, we still want to have it be gold. Yeah. 
Well, well, right. So when the church is illegal, then you do what you have to do. But um, traditionally, uh, um, if you uh, if you offered the mass in something that was unworthy because it was all you had, then you destroy it afterwards. Right. So, so if all you have is is a cup, you know, something glass or ceramic or something like that, um, then then you use it. But then it, it's destroyed afterwards. It's it's never to be used again. Was sort of the the idea with that. Must have been 10, 15 years ago. The parish I was attending, they must have been kind of happened because they got to start saying we're going to start using glass for the vessels because it's I can't even remember reading it before. Well, it's uh, cheaper. It's cheaper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Um, but I guess that just the church is just. A Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, some of the things that I, I don't have with me. Um, what, what's the name of the tall hat worn by the bishop? A mitre, A mitre right? Um, arguably, uh, our, our bishops wear their mitres sideways. Um, the mitre is actually a Jewish, uh, it's, it's a Jewish hat but they wear it twisted 90 degrees so that the two sides are, are going up on the side, not front and back. So somehow we got, we got twisted. But um, so the miter and then the staff that he carries is the crozier, right? The crozier. And then the skull hat, skull cap worn by bishops, and the Pope, it's called a zucchetto called a zucchetto, and the color is, is there to, to dictate um, sort of rank, right? So a um, uh, story of um, one of the, uh, the, the former archbishop of San Francisco, and so um, some, of the, uh, some of the priests down in San Francisco knew him well enough, and uh, it was when, when Pope Benedict was elected pope, and he went to... One of the one of the two major um, places in Rome, and and said, I, you, you know, I would like to get a zucchetto to give to my friend who is just elected pope, but I don't know what size he wears. And the store clerk said, We only make them in one size. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a white zucchetto except in the size that the pope wears them. So. Um, so white, right? The white zucchetto is for the pope. Um, the the red zucchetto is for cardinals. Uh, the magenta one for for the bishops. Um, a priest can wear a black zucchetto, right? Um, and and I've I've seen before um, uh, religious having something of a zucchetto as well that might match more of like their habit. Franciscans having more of a brown one or something like that. Right? But it's just this this skull cap um, that can be can be used. Yeah. Uh, the galero, yeah, that that wide brimmed. <laughs> um. Well, um, it covers the bald spot in your head and keeps it warm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know beyond that. Yes. That, that, that head covering. Um, uh, bishops, um, uh, bishops wear their miter when they are doing bishop stuff, <laughs> when they're acting under their authority, they take the mitre off when they are praying. Um, and then they take the zucchetto off for the consecration. Uh, a couple of other things we grabbed. 
We have the 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 song two spells, right? Um, uh, why are they called the song two spells? They're rung during the song twos, yes. Um, th this is a, a little um, ablution bowl. Thank you. I think it's lavabo, but no, this, we don't call it a lavabo. An ablution bowl. So, so this is just something we've got fresh water in it. So it's, um, but we we use. Um, uh, just so that the priest can wash his fingers after handling the Eucharist, especially during the day when he's he's going in to get communion for the sick or something like that. Candlesticks, right? Processional candles, um, but but uh, we included the the two different colors of candles, right? Um, so this is this is an unbleached candle. Right? Unbleached candles were, were traditionally used for, um, uh, for funerals, for Lent and Advent, right? for those penitential seasons, um, to not have the, the white, bright white bleached candles, um, but to have the unbleached candles. This is where um, the tradition of thinking that the colors of Halloween are orange and black. Right? Be because it's, it's the black vestments and the orange candle that go with funerals, but especially go with All Souls Day, right? Which is two days later, right, from Halloween. And so that, that association of the orange and black. Mm-hmm. The Sanctus candle, the, the same color as the other, yeah. Uh, when you don't use Sanctus bells, you have to crotalus. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's basically it's a it's a clacker um, for for use in in those um, uh, in the context of the tradition when bells are not being used. Um, currently, we will we will use this for Holy Thursday. Um, because really there's not supposed to be any instruments or bells um, going through Holy Thursday and Good Friday, right? But so for the Mass of Holy Thursday, we'll use, we'll use the crotalus. It's one of the more obscure liturgical items to talk about. And I think that's it. I think I got to everything. So, Yeah. Um, um, uh, <laughs> the, the reason we, we are, uh, I, well, um, one of the things that, that I've chosen to do, especially at the parish of blessed sacrament is that we'll always have six candles out for adoration. Just always have six candles out for adoration. Um, uh, that, uh, um, that, that burns more candle wax. <laughs> and as those candles get lower, um, they, they uh, don't look so good in the really tall candlesticks. Um, so I, I got those short candlesticks so that we can have those shorter candles still burning in those shorter candlesticks. Um, but then also it made them more portable so that when we do bring six out for adoration, um, it's, it's much easier for the sacristans or the priests instead of having to move the big ones those smaller ones are much easier to move. So it's really just we're, we're putting six candles on the altar, and sometimes we use different candlesticks in order to make that easier. Well, I wouldn't um, say it's an aesthetic or non-traditional choice. It's, um, it's a practical choice to, um, for, for the, yeah, the burning of... Um, of the wax and yeah. yeah. 
Any other questions? Mm -hmm. There is there's a beautiful tradition of um, uh, the the priest. So his um, his hands are covered in that sacred chrism, and then they're wiped with a manaturgium, a hand towel, <laughs> um, uh, and usually it winds up being a purificator. But that's okay. Um, uh, so they're 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 wiped with that, and the tradition is that he gives that to his mother and that she is buried with it. There is also a tradition that the father of a priest receives the first stole with which his son heard confession. So, yeah. Um, I... <laughs> The colloquial thing is that so um, when when your mother comes to the pearly gates, she she can you know she's got the evidence right that she gave the church a priest, and that'll that'll be in her favor. Um, uh, I I do think there's something beautifully significant about the father receiving the that that stole um, with which the first confession was heard. Um, A uh, little bonus uh, round. There's there's also the Dominican habit, right? Okay. So this this under part of this 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 tunic, right? Um, uh, which we just we just call a tunic, right? It's it's just the the white. And there often has pockets. Um, the, these sleeves are actually like go all the way down to the floor and then are sewn up, right? Um, and that's that's just part of the style. Um, I, I've seen Franciscan friars who have, have something very similar, but they have pockets. They, they they use it as a pocket, and they'll actually reach. And I was I um, spent a semester at, at Franciscan University in Steubenville, and I was taking a, a medieval history class with one of um, one of the Franciscans there, and um, which was kind of cool looking you know, taking a medieval history class from somebody who looked like he was out of the 13th century. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, like, like we're in class and a phone starts ringing and everybody's looking around and he's looking around and then he's like, oh, he reaches in, he pulls out this phone, shuts it off and puts it back in. It's really funny. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, so then, then the the belt, right? Which we we call the belt, um, <laughs> right? But it also, right? It's it's called the cincture, right? Because cincture is that generic name for anything that's really just there to cinch, right? Um, uh, yeah. And uh, and then the the weapon of the Dominican, right? It goes it goes on the left hip just like your sword should, right? Um, that rosary. I, I haven't seen very many Dominicans trying to walk around with a 20-decade rosary. That would be 15 is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the white cloth that goes over the shoulders is called the scapular, which just means, like, over the shoulders. <laughs> it's the scapular. Um, the scapular originates as a, a Benedictine apron. Benedictines would wear a scapular as sort of an apron. Um, beginning with the Dominicans, the, the scapular becomes a garment that's dedicated to Our Lady. Um, the scapular and the rosary, but, but the scapular is really the only part of the habit that is blessed. And it's, it's, this, um, and it's, it's devoted to Our Lady. Um, you'll notice Dominicans don't sit on their scapular. Right, so we'll always pull it in front of us when we sit down, right? Um, and again, it's it's just part of that that honoring of the scapular. We will throw it over our shoulders when we are engaging in some sort of manual labor or eating or doing something like that. Um, uh, 
Yeah, but. No, the the Benedictine um, scapular is not. It's not blessed particularly. It's not dedicated to Our Lady. Um, they'll sit on it. And it's just it's an apron. Like that's what it. That's what it was. That's what it was meant for. Um, yeah. Yeah. The. So the, the brown scapular um, comes from the Carmelite tradition, right? Um, and the, the, uh, as the, the Carmelites, of course, will trace themselves back to the prophet Elijah, right? But um, um, uh, certainly as the, the, the Carmelites are coming um, up in the European scene, um, and they're, they're, they're quickly incorporated into the mendicant movements that are going on, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Um, and so the, the Carmelites basically wind up um, with a Dominican habit in different colors, right? And, and a scapular that's dedicated to Our Lady as well. Um, uh, the, the difference is that the, um, the, the Carmelite scapular became something that was then given to the whole church, right? So that everyone might participate in it. Um, Traditionally, the, the habit, like you wear your habit to bed, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't take off the habit to go to bed. Well, if you can, like, imagine, like, this at night, like, that would just, right? So, so they, they, they wouldn't wear the full scapular to bed. They'd, they'd wear a short scapular to bed. They'd wear a small one, right? And eventually those, those shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until you, you have just the little scapulars, that that we um, wear, and that was that was part of the the habit and um, part of the um, spirituality of the Carmelite order that then gets given to the entire church. Similarly, the rosary is part of the Dominican spirituality. Um, that that for for several centuries really just belonged to the Dominicans and to Dominican confraternities um, of the rosary that they set up, um, and then with um, with Pope St. Pius V, who was a Dominican Pope, and the Battle of Lepanto, um, uh, the rosary is something that's given then to the entire church to pray. Um, uh, so sort of similar lines with that. Uh, I still wear my brown scapular because I was invested with the brown scapular before I became a Dominican. So, um, On top of the scapular is the capoose. Um, and that just that just refers to the hood, right? But it also has this this cloth that goes around, um, and the, the capoose is separated from the scapular um, for the Dominican habit. There are other religious orders where the the hood is built into the scapular. Um, uh, for us, it's it's something that's separated. So the capoose, um, uh, uh, you've, if you've heard of Capuchin Franciscans, right? Their, their, their capoose was ridiculously long. Like, they're huge, right? And so they were the Capuchins because they had such big hoods, right? Um, and then somebody thought that some monkeys looked like them, so that's where they get their name, right? Um, and their habit was, was a, a, a light-colored brown that, that then um, uh, reminded people who were starting to put milk and stuff in their coffee and, and whatnot, and you get a cappuccino. Uh, right? it's, it's coming from that color of their habit. Uh, and then, of course, we have the kappa, right? Which is that, that big black cape that we'll wear, um, especially for, uh, for the penitential seasons. Um, uh, and... and Part of it, right? It's just it's it's heavy and it's warm, right? So it was it was originally the traveling cloak, and it it just so happens that the penitential seasons all happen during winter, which is really nice, right? <laughs> so I think you you wear it for that, but we also wear it for formal events, um, uh, for teaching and and preaching and that kind of stuff. It it, it sort of formalizes. It is the full habit to be wearing that that black cape. 
um, I, I went to a wedding on Saturday. I went to a reception, um, and I thought the wedding was the reception was going to be inside. Um, and I, when I go to a reception, I don't go very often because it usually conflicts with other things. But when I go to a reception, like you, you don't you don't go to somebody else's wedding in all white, right? So, so, um, uh, so I usually wear my kappa. I, it was not inside. It was really hot on Saturday, but, um, yeah. No, the white hood stays on. Um, so I actually, I, I put it up. Right, and this is two pieces as well. Right, and this is also called a capoose, right? It's the same, same thing. Yeah. So, old Dominican habit. Any other questions? Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's never that's been, never been. Um, uh, the the tradition. Um, there 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 generally is a blessing of the water before it's it's used. Um, but um, um, even that that's that's like uh, it's it's like the no it's it's like the blessing of food, right? It's not it doesn't make it holy water. Okay. It's not the blessing that goes with holy water. Um, I, and at least in the Dominican rite, that wasn't that wasn't done during funerals, right? So it was recognized as something that had been added, um, and was not something absolutely necessary. So, yeah. all right. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the beauty of the tradition that has been handed down to us. Strengthen us that we might grow in that appreciation and help us to always then seek to give our hearts entirely to you. We make these prayers using the words your Son, our Savior, taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, and I'm forgetting what we're doing next week. We don't have any next St. Dominic's Mass is next week. That's what it is. Um, it's like, why? I'm not going away next week. <laughs> right. Next weekend, we're celebrating um, um, August 8th. We're celebrating uh, St. Dominic, and we'll be having a special choral mass upstairs. Um, when we come back, we'll be looking more into the Liturgy of the Hours um, and, and going into... Um, talking about the Liturgy of the Hours in general, uh, followed by uh, more of a practicum uh, the week after that to, to really um, be doing that. So uh, until then, we will see you. God bless and have a good night. <laughs>